Hello, I am Professor Sims, and in this video I will discuss biochemical differential tests related to nutrient utilization and combination differential media. This is the eighth in a series of ten lab sessions held as part of my laboratory for the Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If you are a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include observing and describing the processes and byproducts, the utilization of various nutrients by bacterial species, becoming familiar with the concepts of catabolic and anabolic reactions, endoenzymes, exoenzymes, ureases, reductases, hydrolytic enzymes, and hemolysins, and as always, understanding the safety and disposal procedures relating to these experiments. When we're talking about enzymes, we're talking about catalysts. Catalysts help speed up a chemo chemical reaction. They're not used or changed during chemical reactions, and therefore they are reusable. Proteins, called enzymes, serve as catalysts for biochemical reactions that play an important role in controlling cellular metabolism. Metabolism is essentially all of the cellular respiration processes. A lot of that we went over in lab 7. An enzyme functions by lowering activation energy, which is the energy needed to form or break chemical bonds. Chemical reactants to which enzymes bind are called the substrates, and the location within the enzyme where the substrate binds is called the enzyme's active site. Enzymes are known for their specificity. In fact, as an enzyme binds to its substrate, the enzyme structure changes, just like a rubber glove changes its shape when you put your hand in it, right? Um, overall, there is a specificity matched enzyme for each substrate and thus for each chemical reaction. The term anabolism refers to endergonic metabolic pathways involved in biosynthesis, converting simple molecular building blocks into more complex molecules. The opposite of that is ca catabolism. Catabolism refers to exerg exergonic pathways that break down complex molecules into simpler molecules. So catabolic enzymes break down macromolecules so they can cross and enter the bacterial cell membrane. Specific catabolic enzymes must be produced by microbes in order for them to be able to utilize the only available sources of carbon, nitrogen, or sulfur in any given type of artificial media. Um, endoenzymes act inside the cell. Most of these are going to be anabolic in nature, so they're taking smaller molecules and building up macromolecules. And exoenzymes work outside the cell. Most of these are catabolic because they're used in digestion. They break down things and make them small enough to where they can pass the cellular membrane. Dehydration synthesis is the most common type of anabolic reaction. Uh, dehydration synthesis links uh, monomers. Dehydration synthesis links monomers together to make polymers. Now hydrolysis is the exact opposite of dehydration synthesis. It is a catabolic reaction which breaks polymers down into monomers using water and enzymes. Hydrolytic enzymes hydrolyze carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins outside of the cell into substituents that can be transported into the cell. Some bacteria can produce the enzymes amylase and maltase. These are used to break starch down into glucose, which is used to make ATP by glycolysis. Starch is one of the most biologically important polysaccharides, in addition to glycogen and cellulose. They are large polymers composed of hundreds of monosaccharide monomers. This chemical reaction here, you should absolutely uh, commit that to memory. You start with starch. Amylase breaks the starch down into dextrin. The amylase, which has not been used or changed, so it's still available. Then it breaks down dextrin into maltose and then maltase breaks maltose down into glucose. And then that glucose is transported into the cell, into the cytoplasm, where it undergoes glycolysis to make energy. So for experiment one, we are going to test two species of the bacillus genera for their ability to hydrolyze starch. Bacillus are acidophilic and endospore-forming bacteria. Therefore, they can tolerate the low pH that is in PDA media. Unlike a lot of bacteria, they 
bacillus can survive on PDA. Some of these bacillus can also hydrolyze starch, which is abundant in PDA, potato, dextrose, agar has a lot of sugar and starch in it. Iodine is used to visualize the hydrolyzed zones because iodine reacts with starch and it changes to this bluish black color. So after the starch hydrolysis plate incubates, we add iodine to the, to the surface of the plate so we can see where the starch is intact and where it is no longer intact, where it's been hydrolyzed. So in the example I'm giving here, iodine's been added to the surface of the plate and it reacts to make this dark color. This specimen on the left here is showing like this clearing zone around the bacteria. That's where the starch has been hydrolyzed. That's the zone of hydrolysis. And then over here, you don't see that clearing. So that means that this over here is negative for starch hydrolysis. Experiment two tests for gelatin hydrolysis. Gelatin is a protein derived from collagen, a component of vertebrate connective tissues. Gelatinases comprise a family of extra, extra cellular enzymes produced and secreted by some microorganisms to hydrolyze gelatin. Subsequently, the cell can take up individual amino acids and use them for metabolic purposes to make energy. The presence of gelatinases can be detected using nutrient gelatin, a simple test medium composed of gelatin, peptone, and beef extract. Nutrient gelatin differs from most other solid media in that the solidifying agent is also the substrate for enzymatic activity. So the gelatin is what makes the media solid but it's also the thing that we're trying to see if if it can be hydrolyzed with gelatinase right so consequently a tube of nutrient gelatin is stab inoculated to stab culture just like any other deep uh, with a gelatinase positive organism it, well if the organism is gelatinase positive it secretes the enzyme and it liquefies the media in a gelatin hydrolysis test the media starts out as solid you stab it just like any other deep, like a sim or a regular uh, TSA deep, and you incubate it. And if it comes back solid, then it's negative for gelatinase. If it comes back liquid, it is positive for gelatinase. Experiment three tests for the presence of exotoxins called hemolysins, which are able to destroy red blood cells and hemoglobin. Blood agar is sometimes called sheep blood agar because it includes 5% sheep blood in a triptych soy agar base and it allows for differentiation of bacteria based on their ability to hemolyze red blood cells. So the three major types of hemolysis are beta hemolysis, alpha hemolysis, and gamma hemolysis and it depends on the amount and type of degradation. So alpha hemolysis is the partial destruction of red blood cells and it produces this greenish brown discoloration of the agar around the colonies. So you see here, um, it kind of, alpha hemolysis sort of looks, it looks like a bruised apple. Like if you threw an apple on the ground and pick it up, it would have this weird kind of greenish brown bruise on it. That's what alpha hemolysis looks like in the medium. A beta hemolysis is the complete destruction of red blood cells and hemoglobin and it results in a clearing of the medium around the colonies. So you can see that here. And with beta hemolysis, if you hold the plate up to the light and you look through the bottom, you can see clear through that, okay? And gamma hemolysis is actually negative for hemolysis. It appears as simple growth with no change to the media at all. So that's what it looks like down here. Both alpha and beta are considered positive for hemolysis and gamma is negative. Experiment four tests for urea hydrolysis. Urea is a product of decarboxylation of certain amino acids. Urea can be hydrolyzed to ammonia and carbon dioxide by bacteria that contain the enzyme urease. The only nutrients in the urea slants that we're using are urea and a trace amount of yeast extract. Phenol red is included as an indicator you already know that phenol red changes color with changing pH. The pink color in this case is showing an increase in pH. And this increase in pH is due to the form formation of ammonia and hydroxide ions. 
Um, and the pink color is a positive result for a urease test. A yellow color is going to be negative. An orange is usually negative too, but sometimes if you have like a pinkish orange, that could be a positive. Uh, if you have a result that looks like that, then let me know and I'll help you out. But generally, a positive urease test is going to be a nice bright pink. Experiment 5 is the coagulase test. Coagulase works in conjunction with normal plasma components to form a protective fibrin barrier around individual bacterial cells. And this fibrin barrier shields the bacteria from phagocytosis and other types of host attack. The coagulase test differentiates Staphylococcus aureus from other Staphylococci. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus can be highly resistant to normal immune system response and to antimicrobial agents due in part to this production of coagulase. So in a coagulase test, it's actually kind of the opposite of what you're looking for in a gelatinase test. The media actually starts out as a liquid and if it does have coagulase, it's going to form a clot, okay? So it would become semi-solid or it might have a little chunk of solid stuff in it. So this is how it would look in a test tube. This is a positive and a negative. Up here on the slide, you have negative and positive. The positive is kind of hard to differentiate, but, but you can see it better in real life. There's actually a clot. There's like a clump in the in the media. This uh, starts out as plasma, so there's a clot that has formed in this media, and that would be a positive coagulase test. Experiment 6, the citrate test. Uh, this test was designed to identify specific genera within the Enterobacteraceae that can utilize sodium citrate as their sole carbon source using the enzyme citrate permease to transport citrate into the cell and metabolize it by way of the fermentative pathway. Inorganic ammonium salt is used as the sole nitrogen source for these bacteria. They break down the ammonium salt and produce ammonia and hydroxide. So again, the production of ammonia and hydroxide increases the pH. Uh, the hydroxyl ions raise the pH, the color changes, and the indicator used in this is bromophenol blue. It starts out as green. If it has a low pH, it's green. And if the pH is high, it turns into this royal blue, this royal blue color here on the right. So this is a negative citrate test. This is a positive citrate test. Uh, bacteria that do not possess citrate permease are not going to do well on this medium, and some of them may actually die off before they can really propagate. The last experiment that we're doing in lab eight is combination differential media the sim tests these are my favorite this is my favorite kind of media and it's not just because we have the same name sim right um, but it's because they test for three different things at the same time one inoculation one two three tests uh, sim media is used for differentiation of sulfur reduction indole production uh, from tryptophan hydrolysis, and then because it's a deep, you can test for motility as well. The semi-solid medium includes casein and animal tissue as sources of amino acids. Uh, it has iron and has sulfur in the form of sodium thiosulfate. Sulfur reduction to hydrogen sulfide is accomplished by bacteria via the enzymes cysteine desulfurase or the enzyme thiosulfate, either of those reactions, and here's the point, either of those reactions produce the hydrogen sulfide. The hydrogen sulfide reacts with ferrous ammonium sulfate that's in the sim medium, and it produces ferric sulfide. You can actually see the ferric sulfide is a black precipitate, so you can see black chunks in the sim tubes if it is positive for sulfur redu reduction. Indole production in the medium is made possible by the presence of tryptophan contained in the casein and animal protein that's in the medium. So bacteria possessing the enzyme tryptophanase can hydrolyze tryptophan to pyruvate, ammonia, and indole. 
And indole is the one that we can observe. Um, the hydrolysis of tryptophan can be detected, detected by adding COVAX reagent. So whoops, I'll show you what this stuff is. It's in your lab drawers. After you incubate the sim media, then you will add COVAX reagent. Uh, the COVAX reagent contains, this is a tough one, dimethylaminobenzaldehyde, or DMABA for short, and hydrochloric acid dissolved in amyl alcohol. When you add a few drops of the COVAX to the top of the tube, that stuff, the DMABA, reacts with any indole that's present, and it produces a red layer on the top of the tube. So determination of motility, that's the last thing. Determination of motility is done just by doing a stab culture, just like we've seen before with the other beeps way back in lab two. But it can be difficult to determine if your species is modal, if you have a large amount of H2S production, the hydrogen sulfide production. So an example of that would be these guys over here. These guys have, they're positive for sulfur reduction. They have lots of H2S and ferric sulfide, which made the whole media tube turn black. So in those cases, you wouldn't be able to determine motility. Um, but it's not always like that. Sometimes you just have little pieces, little black pieces here and there. Any black precipitate in the media is going to be positive for sulfur reduction. Okay. Um, this guy here is modal. No, wait. This guy here is negative for motility. You can see where he is inoculated. This one is positive. It looks like he has diffused all throughout the media in all directions. And then for indole production, so all of these have had the COVAX reagent added to the top. At first glance, they may all look like they're positive, but they're actually not. These two in the middle are negative for indole production because it has a brown color. If you have any color that is not red or sometimes a bright pink, then that is a negative indole test. Uh, clear is negative. White, like a milky white, is negative. Yellow is negative, and even brown is negative. But if you have a blood red color or a bright, like neon pink color, then those are positive for indole or indole production or uh, tryptophan hydrolysis. Same thing. Okay. So go over your lab eight specimen. Uh, I think at this point we have at least seen all of these. Uh, new one might be Proteus vulgaris. We did observe him for his flagella, but we haven't worked with live specimen, I don't think. Um, you want to be careful with him. He can cause urinary tract infections and other types of infections. Uh, you want to be careful with all of them. You want to treat everything like they're a pathogen, even if they're not necessarily. Uh, Urinobacter orogenes is also he's an opportunistic pathogen, but if, if he does infect you, it can get pretty nasty. So you be careful with him, yeah. Make sure you go through your safety guidelines. These are all going to be, again, very similar to things that we have seen before. For your observations and interpretations, I do recommend that you have at least one person in your group print this slide in color if possible because it will help you when you come back after all your stuff is inoculated and you come back for lab nine. Everything's on one page here, so this can help help you guys to get through your results. And it's all in one place, so it's, it's very handy. And since we're getting close to the final exam, I want you guys to start thinking about what kind of questions do you have. We've done a lot. We've covered a lot since the midterm. So come to the lab ready for a discussion, ready for Q&A. And go ahead and start writing some sample questions, things that you think you might see on an exam covering, especially lab 8, lab 7 material, because it's a lot. The enzymes, the cellular respiration, metabolic pathways, all of this stuff can be overwhelming. So go ahead and start thinking about some questions that you might have, some explanation you might need. Start quizzing yourself. It would be really good to start early. Okay, so thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.